Okay, Haley, thank you so much for being our presenter today. We're excited to hear from you. Take it away whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Andrea. Um, I'm so glad to see all of your faces and hear from all of you today. Um, today, uh, oh, if you don't know me, I guess I should start with that. Um, my name is Haley O'Toole. I um, do cultural and historical interpretation at the garden, um, which is a pretty big umbrella thing for lots of different things. Um, but part of what I do is um, figure out how to tell stories about the garden in a way that helps our visitors learn more about us. So I ask your forgiveness here at the beginning of this presentation um, because I've never presented about this topic before. This is a brand new presentation, um, but this idea came from trying to think through how um, we're doing research about artifacts in our artifact profile project um, and kind of identifying how we tell stories and what storytelling is. Um, and so today we're going to, we're gonna do a little bit of that. Uh, those are two very big words, um, storytelling and artifacts, and they mean a lot of different things to different people. So I wanted to kind of think through how we tell stories as educators at the garden uh, to help people connect to the place. Uh, this can, often require the use of props or other engagement tools, but often it, it really is truly just the language that you use or the way that you speak with a visitor or um, someone you're engaging with. That's what pulls people in and what grabs their interest. So um, this requires kind of knowing your audience and how they learn, um, which are some of the things that we're gonna talk through today. So uh, thank you, Andrea, for muting everyone. And again, if you have questions or things that come to your mind in the course of this, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat or write it down and there will be an opportunity to kind of talk through some of those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Andrea? Great. So today we are going to start with talking about the history of storytelling. Where does it come from? How have we used it for centuries? Um, then we're gonna talk about careers that influence storytelling, um, especially the one that I am most familiar with, which is curation. We're gonna talk a little bit about how historians do research to inform uh, the stories that connect to people. We're gonna talk a bit about the Artifact Profile Project that we have been embarking on for the past few years, but have really ramped up since we've gone into quarantine. We're gonna do uh, just a brief walkthrough to show you how to access that virtual repository of the Virtual Tower Grove House. And then we're gonna have a little bit of time for questions, comments, feedback, everything like that at the end. So again, write them down or throw them in the chat box so they don't leave your mind. Andrea, can you advance one more slide for me? Thank you. So what is storytelling? Um, a general definition of storytelling describes the social and cultural act activity, thank you, oh, there it is, of sharing stories, sometimes with improvisation, theatrics or other embellishment. Um, every culture has its own stories and narratives to tell, um, which are often shared as a means of entertainment or as education. They can be culturally relevant or preserving the history of a society, or they could be simply instilling good moral values in whoever is listening. Those crucial elements of stories and storytelling um, are, are pretty basic and things that we learned often when we were children. I remember in high school English, they taught you about what a plot is, who the characters are, having a narrative point of view and an arc that reaches a climax and eventually has a resolution. Um, all of those things are required to make a good story, whether that's real or imagined. Um, and truthfully, um, this became something I started to reflect a lot about because the evolution of storytelling over time really reflects how people learn and how people communicate. So through oral storytelling or written storytelling, the voice of a narrator can ha create an opportunity to share a purpose in, in culture or in a place, which is very much what we are trying to do at the garden. Um, though the mediums have changed quite a bit over the centuries, the core concept of using a sequence of events in an exciting way has kind of remained the same. The, the goal is to connect people to one another and to retain our culture and history. 
um, which is why I thought this was kind of a relevant topic to discuss today. Storytelling started all the way back in caveman times, as many of you know, um, as they used pigments to draw pictures on cave walls um, of what they were witnessing or as a way to create those origin stories on something tangible. So um, they, they're trying to answer universal questions like, why are, are we here? How did we get here? And what are we doing as, as the human experience on the planet? Um, these are universal questions are kind of what stories can still answer today um, and and using language to kind of cement that you know people all the way back to the ancient Greeks began to write down via stone tablet um, those stories and those traditions about um, both where they came from and everyday life what their life experience was like and what their priorities within their culture were so for example, the ancient Greeks lived close to a coast, and so a lot of their um, stories are centered around fish or fishing for food. Um, they discovered ways to use a lot of those tools to carve messages into tombs or slates, indicating to us now in the present what their priorities were or what they were busy doing in the course of a day. Um, prior to that, people had been communicating orally for thousands of years, but Cementing writing really changed the way that people tell stories because it changed the audience and changed the way that people relate to one another and pass down that type of information. Um, as things developed, they were eventually telling stories about war or they're telling stories about sadness or celebration um, and really encapsulating those priorities of their culture. And this is really important to us in the present um, and and we've seen over time how people have have navigated making that system easier uh, all the way to today although i often joke that i feel like we've gone back to caveman times with uh, emojis and other text messaging formats um it's a full circle at this point um but having people um in a community sharing these stories is really what cements history and, and navigates the complexities of a culture um, into the future. I, in doing research about this, I found a lot of really interesting comparisons. Um, one of the most important texts to Christian culture is the Bible, which was written around 1300 BC. But a lot of those were a compilation of stories or other myths, legends told by people orally over time and then cemented into one book that was more digestible for a public audience. Um, so the goal being, you know, telling these, these lessons with the religious purpose that, you know, learning new, new ideas and new, new uh, through storytelling allowed the public at large um, to get to know a religious belief system. Um, the public was really relying on oral tradition in that regard, um, and the Bible started to make those changes for them and still is a model in storytelling today. Um, I also noted William Shakespeare, who was born in 1564 in a very complicated time in human history, but he would come to write over 37 plays in the course of his lifetime, which was very short compared to current standards, um, but he was a huge stepping stone in building storytelling narratives because his work was so expansive and relatable um, to everyone through the use of universal themes. Um, to this day, Shakespeare is still one of the most performed playwrights of all time and is continuously adapted for film and for theater um, because of those themes. Those themes still apply to culture in a very strong way. Um, uh, again, things that we know by, by oral tradition now also uh, come in the form of fairy tales or other other informational stories that help guide people um, to really to really know how to act or or what the belief system of their culture might be so again asking yourself what all these storytellers might have in common um, they're all speaking to a specific audience whether that's peers or a group of faithful followers some of these examples show you how storytelling has was harnessed to teach to remember, 
to engage or to even sway people into a specific belief system. Um, all of these storytellers are using these universal themes to ensure that they reach the most amount of people. So let's dig into that a little bit. Andrea, can you flip the slide? Thank you. Most stories that are told or written either way are, are done so with the audience in mind. So for example, those fairy tales that I referenced were created to teach children basic life lessons um, in the form of stories um, like Hansel and Gretel, which is meant to scare children to not go into the woods. Um, there is, there are characters who are doing actions and through experience, uh, the listener is learning what to, to do or what not to do. Um, telling a story can be a tangible example of how legends or a myth can inform your decision making and your present action. Um, again, teaching the audience something new to help them make more informed decisions, which I think is something we're trying to do as, uh, as great interpreters at the garden. So who is the audience that we are speaking to? This is one of the most difficult or challenging parts of our job um, because we don't always know who our audience is when we start to think through what kind of stories we're gonna tell on a tour or in an engagement in Tower Grove House. Um, we might know general things, especially if you're in like a classroom setting, um, but sometimes as docents or interpreters at Tower Grove House, we are treading this dangerous line um, between making assumptions based on small conversations or the appearance of a person to kind of direct what kind of stories we're telling. Again, this is dangerous um, and takes years of, of kind of finessing that appropriately to kind of identify what the audience is looking for when they arrive in a space. Um, however, that is when these universal themes come into play. So themes like good and evil, food ways, family, community, all of these are topics that all humans can relate to in some way, regardless of background, origin, or race. So these human commonalities kind of allow a storyteller to find a relationship with the broadest audience. Um, in fact, these themes are often employed as ways to create an equality with the audience. So sometimes you're getting a group of people from all over, you're kind of meshing people together in a tour group, and finding these universal themes allows everyone to be on the same page and relate to things that are universally um, associated regardless of your background. So I use this example often because a lot of people ask about Henry Shaw and his love life. Every one of us gets that question on a very regular basis. Um, and not everyone is trying to be nosy, some people are. Um, but most of that stems from the audience trying to find a universal theme that they can relate to. So a lot of people can relate to falling in love. They can relate to beginning a family or having children. Um, I've been surprised at how many people feel really comfortable and are more ready to engage about the Trelease narrative um, that we've been presenting for the past couple years because a lot of their story is much more relatable to the lives that we lead today. They have children, they're a nuclear family, they have a lot of things about them that you can imagine or use as a universal theme to relate to other people, um, regardless of the age or the background of the participant. So I ask you here to kind of think about the way that you tell stories on a base level to family or friends. I am very fortunate, I am married to a storyteller. Um, if any of you have seen the movie Big Fish, which is what this image is of on your screen, that's homework. If you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful movie about storytelling. My husband is very much the main character. Um, he inherited this skill from his grandfather. He has a story for every possible thing in the world. Um, any topic that you bring up, anything that you might want to talk about, my husband probably has a story about it. And at times, I am certain that he toes the line between reality and some inflated truths um, for storytelling value. Um, early in our relationship, I found my analytical brain Googling things, trying to like catch him in it until I really processed that that is a tool that is very useful in today's world because 
he, he, he meets people all the time, brand new people who he is caring for their animals. By employing this art of storytelling, you are able to achieve the most basic part of human communication, which is to make someone comfortable with you, be that in a new place, with a new topic, or with a new idea. And this has psychological effects. Once a person um, does not feel threatened physically or emotionally in a new place, they are more likely to become open to new information and the opportunity to create a memorable experience is born. I see many of you do this on a regular basis when you're having interactions with the general public, asking some minor personal questions to kind of find where that connection point is um, before you start a tour. Often that connection is made in the form of a personal story or a fun fact but oftentimes we're able to take that story and translate it into something that you're ready to talk about and a new story that relates to either history, plant science, or something that you're going to share on the tour. Um, this storytelling becomes an educational tool. Um, this requires reading the person, identifying how they learn, and then tailoring that information that you have rolling around in your brain that is factual, names, dates, things like that, to be able to teach the individual in a comfortable way through storytelling. Can you advance to the next slide, please, Andrea? Now, I have to circle back to this notion of audience because part of our goal as educators is to teach. Those moments always start with the audience and, and that comes with assessing what kind of learner you're talking to. Um, now, storytelling in the 21st century is more complicated than in past years because we have a variety of mediums and ways that people get information and digest information. Um, but I wanted to reflect um, just briefly on the different types of learners and how they might intercept a story as you start to process how best to share information. So visual learners, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And for some people that is 100% true. Uh, as our culture focuses more on technology, visual learners intercept the most from what is presented in an image or in a video uh, right in front of them. Looking at that image can elicit much more of a response than you're going to get by orally sharing information with them. Um, some people just can't imagine what you're describing when you're using words. Um, so I have seen a lot of success with this, especially with our younger generation because our younger generation is being trained to intercept much more information uh, virtually, especially right now. Um, but by pairing this visual, say a historic image um, or another video presentation with the oral storytelling that you're doing, you're able to weave together a much more relatable historic presentation. Um, for example, these learners would benefit from engaging with an artifact by encouraging them to look at it um, with a detailed eye, so asking them about colors or decor elements or even about the fabrication, things that they see, allowing them to use their eyes to tell you more about what they see or taking an image that you're able to carry with you and asking them what they see to start that storytelling process and come together with what you might have to share um, that is educational. Auditory learners are the people who traditional storytelling work best for because they are comfortable with that oral tradition of passing information from generation to generation, listening um, to a traditional presentation in a classroom or following instructions that you're providing verbally. Um, and these are often our favorite people on tour because it's much more natural for them to engage with you by you just telling an oral story. Um, they, they ask questions questions, they're more likely to engage. Um, however, when I encounter these, these learners, I try to start my story with a can you imagine um, to encourage them to paint that visual into their mind and pair that together with that story that you're telling. These learners are going to be very good at trying to create that image as you tell a story with an action, with a climax, and with a resolution um, as, you, as you go through that story with them. Kinesthetic learners are people who learn in a hands-on way. Um, these learners fire on all cylinders when you remove all of the extra words and all the visuals and let them learn with their hands. Um, this sounds like 
quite a challenge in our setting, um, especially in a place like Tower Grove House where um, there's a lot of things that can't be touched. But even with the living collection, I'm sure many of you are comfortable asking people not to touch. Um, but we have consistently tried to unpack that and find ways uh, to do that. Before we were going into quarantine, uh, my colleague in interpretation, David, and I were working on touch boxes that were going to be installed into Tower Grove House, um, which would include something like the insides of a bed, inside of a box that someone can put their hand in and feel what the insides of a historic bed would feel like. Um, allowing people to do that touchable part, to look at an object and then touch, uh, to feel like they're more connected and to better understand. Um, I know all of you are thinking right now, we do all of these things, um, which is true because in education, we are all, regardless of what department you work with, very committed to catering to all types of learners and to all audiences. Um, but now you're also probably asking yourself, Haley, I thought this presentation was about artifacts. Um, we can't touch or we can't get close to some of these artifacts in Tower Grove House. How am I gonna talk about these things? So what if I told you your words can service all of these types of learners and the artifacts? Andrea, can you turn the page? Interpretation. Many of you work within our department and many of you have heard me present on this topic a lot. Um, I always have to plug Freeman Tilden, who, uh, the man you may have been introduced to previously. Oh, it hasn't turned yet. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Christy. Um, he is the father of interpretation. Um, now I have to mention him only because the field of interpretation, in my opinion, can be summarized as intentional storytelling for educational purposes. Um, by sharing these relevant audience appropriate stories with the public, you are finding connection points that create educational moments um, by framing your interaction as a story instead of a robot spewing facts um, with a main character, often not a person, um, and with a story arc with at least one universal theme, the human brain is intercepting and remembering information easier. Um, and with accurate facts and dates and names to influence what that story sounds like, you are offering a more relatable and connective experience. Can you advance the slide, Andrea? It's my beloved Velcro slide. You know I don't give a presentation without the Velcro slide. Because an interpreter's job is to take a visitor's pre-existing knowledge and adhere it to new information. That's how learning happens. The Velcro doesn't work if there isn't anything to stick to. So by understanding how the audience learns, what, what they may already know, uh, and, and layering a new story on top of that, you're able to provide an educational opportunity, which is why we're all here. And you'll hear me say it over and over again, and, and, I, and I think a few or many are off put when I say this, um, but while we have some very extraordinary antiques in Tower Grove House, it's all just stuff. Without you as the mouthpiece to tell the story of these artifacts, they are just old things sitting in an old house. They're not doing anything without you telling stories about them. Nothing hurts me more than to hear an interpreter say, yeah, it's a neat house with some old stuff in it. That literally breaks my heart because what I would love to hear is that there are millions of stories to be told in that house about the people and the cultures who use those objects. Let me tell you one and use that as an opportunity to really tap into what is going to connect these visitors to the object. Um, by weaving together the importance of the item to the people who used it, you're bringing those people and their life experiences into the present. You are bringing those to life by telling these stories. And you are putting together a puzzle of their life experience to teach more universal themes, uh, to make a visitor feel like they can and do relate to the life experiences of people in history. That is what history is truly about um, to me. Uh, making people of today feel not so far away from people hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, this includes the good, the bad, the ugly. This is 
relating to people of the past creates empathy to their decision making, to the way that they live, to better understand and, and identify why people made the decisions that they made and how that's impacted the world that we live in today. If we do this correctly, we are creating memorable educational moments that are enhancing the care and connection to the place that we are, because that is part of the goal is to continue to encourage people to explore and learn from our space and come back uh, and, and to learn more about our community and ourselves in that process, no matter how complex that narrative might be. Um, so, so how do we research these stories? So, so how do we figure all that out? Andrea, can you pick up the next slide, please? I would be remiss if I didn't share a little bit about the process of how we both care for objects, um, but how that informs the stories that we're telling. Um, being a curator means a lot of things. Um, depending on the type of institution you work for or the type of collection that you interact with. Um, traditionally, a definition of a curator is just a manager of an overseer of a collection, um, a kind of a keeper of a cultural heritage. Um, and at times, hopefully that definition includes someone involved with the interpretation of the heritage material, including artifacts. Uh, simply put, this means taking care of stuff and telling stories about them which is my goal on a daily basis. Um, you've heard me talk about the storytelling part of this equation, um, but those stories do center around objects. So let me tell you a little bit more about how we do this. Um, when I entered this field, I really didn't identify how crucial uh, telling stories would be or how it would impact uh, my work. Truthfully, I was most interested in the preservation side of caring for artifacts. Um, I was fortunate to attend a graduate program that taught me the importance of telling stories with artifacts, um, both teaching me how to care for the objects, but also teaching me how to research and tell stories about them. I learned to care for artifacts through courses designed to teach you how objects are made. So I literally went to school with courses that would be all about wood and furniture and then I'd take one all about ceramics and then I would take one all about art and slowly pull together the variety of different types of materials um, that make up artifacts um, make up what we what we use so uh, this informs how you care for them knowing exactly where they come from or how they're made and impacts how we care for objects um, again there are many different rules associated with caring for objects. I call most of our artifacts retirees. Um, like many of you, they uh, are, are not doing a specific job anymore, but still have a ton of value. Uh, they, that means we don't sit on chairs, we don't drink out of the tea set. Uh, those objects only function is to tell these stories, um, which is what we are trying to give a voice to. And as many of you know, as you've seen me clean the house at times, um, the most important thing that we consider when we care for objects, along with telling stories about them, um, is will any action we do to them be reversible? We want everything we do to be non-permanent. Um, everything needs to be reversible to ensure that if a better system of caring comes along in the future, I haven't permanently changed their structure or function. This. It's kind of a leave no trace uh, attitude, which applies well to historic objects um, in, in making decisions for the best uh, long-term life of the object. Um, our goal as curators, and I would hope that my colleagues would agree with me, is to preserve objects in perpetuity. So this is not obviously 100% possible because everything is organic and decaying in some way, but slowing down that process is extremely important in, in the work that we do to make sure that they continue for centuries and centuries to be opportunities to tell stories. Um, I, in doing this type of work, I feel like I create a certain level of intimacy with these objects and that as I clean them and mend them, I get to know the nooks and crannies where there's a nick in the corner or a low spot in a painting. Um, this helps me make sure that no dramatic changes happen over time, but it also deepens 
my understanding of the object and helps inform those stories as we do research and learn more about the life of the object. Um, and, and when I say telling stories, I don't just mean doing research. Research informs that narrative um, and, and doesn't always provide the most relatable connectors. Um, those facts um, become a part of the fabric of creating this connective experience. Andrea, can you flip the slide? How do we find this information? I wanted to share a little bit about this only because I know some of you also care for older items, um, either within your own homes or in other capacities. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit about how we source the information that we share with you in artifact profiles. So historians use a combination of primary and secondary sources to inform what they know about a specific topic. Um, as a reminder, a primary source would be a newspaper article from the time, a journal written by um, the person that you're researching, archival information like photographs or even oral history, someone speaking about the experience um, if technology allowed at the time. Uh, something that is directly from the time period, um, written by someone who experienced or witnessed it as an event. Secondary sources would be things like articles on the topic written by historians, um, documentaries, magazines, books um, that, that assess from a broader perspective uh, what was going on, um, usually through a historical lens. Um, we are very fortunate to have a good assortment of primary sources at the garden, firstly because Henry Shaw was a very detailed record keeper. Um, but as an organization, we have been, we've been organized since a very early time. So we have a lot of legal and organizational documents that help fill some of the gaps in the history. However, there are still mysteries, which is why research continues. Many of the things that our volunteers have asked me questions about over the years have led to discovery in other archives throughout the nation. Um, even our own Trelease family, while I was writing that narrative, I, I worked diligently with many other places because our organizational documents only told us what Dr. Trelease did here at the garden, what his work was, how he impacted the herbarium, how he ran the garden. That didn't tell me much about his family life or the life experience of anyone living in Tower Grove House during that time. Um, I had to look outside our organization to other archives to find more of that personal information. And right now we're using a lot of online resources because my favorite resource, the library, is not always accessible um, because of the current situation. Um, so a MOBOT has its own library, so we're able to uh, internally um, work together with them to get what we need. But these digital resources that I have on the screen are, are extremely uh, supportive and helpful. They're great repositories for researching topics. Um, this, again, could apply to anything you have at home. If you find the right key terms, a key term is usually a word that is used to describe the object in some way. Um, or it perhaps might be about the function of the object. So say you want to research a bed that you have, you might need to research sleep practices or something of that nature. A lot of what I've shared on here can be great um, in terms of, of learning more about what historians say about the topic um, or what research is being done, perhaps on the sp specific type of item that you have, if you can identify it fairly clearly. Can you advance a slide, please, Andrea? So currently, the primary function of the interpretation team in doing research about our collection supports the Artifact Profile Project. So this, the team has accomplished quite a bit since we've been in quarantine um, because we have a bit more time to focus on some of those types of projects. Um, it's been a ton of fun to see how that's blossomed and it's really beneficial to the collection because all of the, the things I cited earlier about caring for the collection um, really, uh, really is informed by what we know about how objects are made, where they come from, what, how old they might be. All of that research can inform how we care for the objects as well as help you tell those stories um, to visitors when they ask questions about the objects. Uh, this project began in 2016 when I began my role here at the garden. 
uh, and identified a huge gap in the knowledge base about artifacts specifically. Um, much of the information I had heard being shared by interpreters was at times just maybe a fun fact about it or what little information we did know about it. Um, and it kind of became clear where we needed to learn a little bit more. Um, this was not always the relatable type of information um, that kind of shares the importance of the object to culture. There's a huge difference between saying, that is a chair that Henry Shaw sat in. And let me tell you about how this chair was made and why Henry Shaw would have chosen it to sit in every day. Um, the system I created kind of stems from exercises I used to do while I was a graduate student. So they would assign us to um, find five objects in the collection of the museum that we worked um, with every week. And I would have to journal about them. Um, I would have to draw pictures of them, which were never good. Um, you'd have to look very closely and describe what they looked like, what color they were, where there were wear marks from someone holding it or touching it. Was it chipped? Did it have any distinguishable features like maker's marks or, or other information that help you know more about where it came from? And then we take all that and then we do research about the object, how it was made how to identify it. And, and oftentimes we were proved wrong. This was definitely an exercise our teacher gave us to teach us what not to do. But as I got, uh, over time, I got better at spotting some of those details, things like hand press nails versus factory made nails um, and how that impacts what you know about objects. So this also um, taught me a huge lesson in answering one important question, which is who used this object and why? All of those artifact profiles that you should be reading at a very base level should be answering that question. So I applied this to the way of thinking as we tried to disseminate more research interpretive material to staff and volunteers um, about some of the objects I was hearing most of the questions asked about. Many of you remember the first few I wrote were one or two pages, very simple with some factual information and nothing fancy, but as this project has grown to include other researchers and a more diverse range of objects, um, all the way from buildings to tiny forks, I have uh, found myself creating a more succinct format of sparking research and sharing information that informs the stories that you tell for visitors. So if you advance to the next slide, Andrea, I wanted to share kind of the outline that I provide our team members to kind of guide their research. So you know a bit more about the questions that they're asked to answer and how those questions might impact the way that you choose to tell a story. Um, so question one or, or, or section one is about the history of the object. This is a very broad history. This can start with the first notions of the object in ancient history. Um, this might include where this item might have been originally located geographically or who was using the item at that time or why it was invented. Oftentimes, this is a section that more broadly talks about the function of the object. So um, David just wrote a wonderful profile about the toilet upstairs in Tower Grove House and the beginning of his profile talked about waste, wastewater, wastewater systems, and how humans have devised that over time to eventually inform the creation of a toilet. Um, so, so identifying function at times is the first step to, to really know how the object is important or how that might be, um, might be useful to the culture that we're going to discuss. Um, this is always my favorite section because this is the best place to identify those universal themes. Um, the example I gave about waste is something all humans can relate to, no matter their age, gender, age, or, or, or interest base, socioeconomic class, we all relate to human waste. So identifying some of those things that, that people can identify as something that is important to them uh, can be found in that section at times. And next we talk about the role of the artifact in the time period or what we call cultural significance. How was this item used during the time interpreted uh, in the room that the artifact is living in? So 
This could be on a Henry Shaw timeline, or this could be on the Trulies timeline if it applies specifically to Tower Grove House. Um, but what does this mean to the culture? What social class was using this item and, and how was that impacted by manufacturing? I feel like we've really started to dig deep into giving, giving both a voice and some awareness to the individuals who were using the objects. So Sean just wrote a really great profile about sideboards. Um, the sideboard is lovely and something that Henry Shaw might have picked out himself, but Henry Shaw was not touching the sideboard on a daily basis. The people he employed uh, to serve him meals, cook for him, clean his house, those were the people touching that sideboard. Those were the people serving off of it. Those were the people cleaning it and using it as a functional item. Uh, so really identifying who was using the object. The cook stove, um, M just completed a really great profile about the stove in, in the kitchen right now. And they did some amazing research about the people that the Trillis family would have employed and who those people would have been, what their life experience would have been like. Um, so if you haven't read that one yet, that's a great profile also. Um, but this section really should help the reader understand why this object existed, what its function was, and who was using it. Some of the most lovely things that people look at often, um, like the tea table in the parlor that I wrote on many moons ago, who knows how often that was actually being used. Some of these more functional objects like the stove or the sideboard are extremely interesting because they're daily items that people were using that many people forget about, but had a huge role to play in, in how life functioned and, and what that represented to the people who were coming to visit Tower Grove House. Uh, the third section talks um, about garden implication. So that has to do with specifically our collection item. Um, that usually includes a physical description of the item, especially with details, um, because sometimes the object is too far for the naked eye to see some of the detail work, um, if it's further away from where the public's walking path is. Um, asking, you know, where did this item originate? Is it a Shaw original or is it an item that's donated? Um, we have an, an amazing amount of original Henry Shaw items that is not normal for a collection. Um, so we're very proud of that amount of provenance, but we also have some really interesting donated items that are really adding to our stories that, that are pretty cool to, to learn more about. And, and talking about if the design is unusual or how things were manufactured at that time. Um, the, the bedroom set, for example, in the children's bedroom on the Trilly side has an amazing mark inside the drawer of the maker's name and where it was made and the year and is very specific and allows us to learn a lot more about the maker and how they, how they functioned, how they, how they produced um, because they were a well-known maker on the East Coast. So um, that section should share more about the physical object. Again, all of these sections might connect to those different types of learners that we talked about earlier um, in different ways. So the last section with the physical description of the object might connect more to a visual learner. Um, we're talking about the role of the artifact in the time period or, or the history portion might connect more to an auditory learner where you can tell more about um, how things were designed at that time. Andrea, can you advance a slide? I'll never miss an opportunity to plug your thoughts and ideas um, because we still have room to grow. Uh, many of the most obvious mysteries or questions have been answered. Um, but I'm all ears for other things that you've heard from visitors about what they want to know more about or things you've looked at and wondered, what is the story with that thing? Um, we've revealed some unbelievable information, debunked myths in the process, and our team has really become invested in sharing more quality researched information about these artifacts on display. Um, so if you have ideas, thoughts, or interests specifically, please don't hesitate to email me. I'd love to know more about what you guys want to know more about in the future. Andrea, can you advance? 
So we've talked about telling stories and how people learn. And now we've talked about artifacts and how we research artifacts. So where is this repository of artifact profiles? When we entered quarantine, Morgan, Mall Smith, and myself, along with Andrea, started to talk about the best ways to share these artifact profiles. Um, I had more coming in than ever because of the amount of time we could spend researching here in quarantine. And while the Vine has been a great way to share those in the past across departments, I've been working to find a way to make these more accessible to volunteers in a more condensed way, something that's more of a repository or an archive of what we're producing. Um, with the added unknowns of not really knowing when we would return or when we'd be able to put this stuff back into practice, um, we elected to put together a virtual Tower Grove House tour. You may have seen it plugged in the Vine or in other places, um, but we're using a technology called Guide by Cell. Um, we've used this technology to do other scavenger hunts and other engagements um, in our department from a broader perspective, but we've never really piloted a tour before. Um, so with Morgan in the tech driver's seat and with me providing the content, we put together a room by room walkthrough um, that includes the opportunity to hyperlink the artifact profiles as PDFs. So we created kind of a uniform format um, and now we're kind of off to the races. We rolled it out to you all first as volunteers. We got some great feedback from that. Um, and now we've actually published it to the, the public. So now we've got about 260 unique users um, so I wanted to take a few minutes and kind of just walk through this to show you how this works. Um, so that way you can continue to explore this repository and it might be something fun to read while we're all looking for, for new ways to think about the garden and, and learn a few more narratives. So Andrew, can you flip to the online portion? Thank you. So if you're using a desktop, you're going to see that assortment of bubbles. If you want to click on say the parlor, Sure, yes. It's gonna have a picture. It's gonna have a brief description of the room. And then you're going to see in the description an assortment of blue clickable links that are often describing artifacts. When you click on that, it should pull up a PDF of whatever the artifact was it was describing. Um, these are printable or downloadable if you wanna save your own archive, but these will live here in perpetuity until something better comes along. We, we are very proud of this solution. Um, we were racking our brains. Um, yes, and this is a particularly good profile um, because they wrote it. Thank you for that in the chat, that's so true. <laughs> Um, but we really wanted to find a place where you all would have access to these profiles at any given time. So any page you click on, yep. Ooh, yes. So if a you Victoria read the, the Vine this last week, we, you'll, you'll have already seen this, but this is where we find the Venetian lady painting, which is Kyle, well done, which is the most recent artifact profile. Haley, is that right? Yes. Yes. So, so many we, options. I so know. We got, so all of these live in each page. So you would just have to flip through page by page and maybe click on one that you've never clicked before. Um, I would look through. I know a lot of you have been very diligent about being readers of this project for the last few years, which I thank you for. Um, but there might be a few in there that you may have forgotten or you haven't read yet. So I'd encourage you to flip through this. It also is very um, cell phone friendly. If, or, or iPad friendly, uh, again, the technology is meant for a cell phone. Um, so you can access the link as well um, that Andrea has put in a, a few Vine issues now um, to, to be able to flip through that at your own leisure. Um, so with that, I want to open the floor for questions. I know I've thrown an assortment of information at you. Um, I need to check the chat to see. I think I had a few questions in the chat. Haley, we do have some questions. Um, let me go back. Carol asked for some specific examples of maybe specific artifacts with a story we can use. Yeah, that's a good question. I biasly would say all, 
artifacts have stories, but some of them have more obvious stories. Um, and, and I know even, I know specifically Betty tells me, or I've, I've seen storytelling about the piano. Um, and, and a very, uh, that story is fun again, because it has a universal theme of good and evil and being wronged and, and a certain level of juice to it. Um, but at the same time, that story would pair very nicely with the artifact profile about the piano. So, so using that story as an entry point, if you're going to tell that story, uh, starting with, you know, here's what's happening in the juicy part of the story, and then pause to say, this would have been the type of piano that they would, that, that she would have been arguing over. This piano has 82 keys. It is made of rosewood, which did you know rosewood is a uh, no longer traded type of wood and is only traded on the black market because it's almost extinct in the wild. Um, and start adding in some of those factual, informative, fun things beyond just, you know, the story is your hook, like the story is your grab, and you're inserting that hard research, those names, those dates, that factual stuff um, as you go along to make the story richer, to hopefully connect to the audience, because everybody in your group might not care about the dirt. You know, grandma might be asking about the dirt, but dad over here wants to hear more about rosewood and the type of wood that the piano is made out of and why that's, you know, no longer allowed to be traded publicly, you know, and, and the tree story behind it. Or, or somebody might want to know more just about the piano because they love pianos and they want to know more about the keys and how it's made and things like that. So, so taking that story, which is, is fun and has an arc and has characters and has all of those things, the climax, and inserting some of that educational information to make it more engaging. You've taken what is an engaging story and something that people follow, and then you're slowly dropping in some of those educational pieces to really share more about why the object is important. The object isn't necessarily the most the most important thing about the object is not necessarily that Henry Shaw fought a woman about one in 1858 it's more about what pianos mean to the culture what what pianos represent to Victorian culture why was this something that was being given as a gift why was this something that somebody was trying to take why did this mean this to someone um, and and using that story as a hook or a grab and then inserting that educational information. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Haley, we had another question. Frederick, uh, yes, I will get to your question. Um, Annette asked if the online resources you shared are open to anyone or those whose jobs are in historical research. Em, I think already answered this question that most yeah. are available for free, except for JSTOR, that, that you need a subscription. Um, and sometimes JSTOR can be accessed through your public library. So if your library has, if you, you would have to ask the librarian, um, there are, most libraries have accounts with these types of online resources. Um, and so a lot, it would just depend on if the library has an account and if it's free use for members. So uh, I've, I've encountered public libraries that are a part of these types of specific online journals um, that will give you access. So you might just have to ask. Yes, Frederick, your question. Uh-oh, Frederick, you might need to type it. No, no, I'm so sorry. I want to hear you very much. Does anyone else have a question while Frederick's typing this very quickly? Were there any other questions in the chat? Um, I think we answered all the questions. Jackie Bainter wants to know if this recording can be shared with others. Yes. Okay. Yes, why not? So yes, Jackie and Dan, the answer is yes. I Any know this, this felt like a very um, random topic. Again, I will share that this just kind of came out of the depths of my mind um, in, in that 
you know, as much as we might not be presently using this skill, um, this is a skill that we hone over time and think more, more deeply about how we share what we share at the garden. You know, we're, we're consistently asking people um, kind of what they want to know more about or how we can best engage with our public. Um, and this storytelling approach, I think, is very, is very much that relational comfort level barrier breaker that helps people really feel comfortable and really start to digest or relate to the information that you're sharing. Um, again, if we wanted robots to spew information, we would have like someone tinkering somewhere. We'd, we'd, I don't think Andrea is making a robot at her house yet. Not yet, no. We really value what you bring to the conversation in, in your own personal storytelling way um, and how you deliver that information is, um, is really important to us. That's very funny, John Lawler said, challenge accepted because I almost named him as the most likely to be making a robot in his home in this quarantine. So that's quite ironic, but... Um, I did Ailey, there was I a question from Ginny if we have yeah. any new artifacts this summer. What can I what can I advertise that's in the works? Right now, um, my friend Christy is writing about beds, which has been very interesting to talk to her about because it's literally the history of sleeping, um, which is very interesting. Um, what is David's working on a two part um a two part to his toilet and now he's working on the bathtub. Um, so I've really, I'm trying not to pigeonhole him in, in water waste, but it's very interesting and very important. Um, who else is, oh, Sean. Sean is working on that egg shot glass holder that I love in the parlor. It's this cute little decorative egg that has shot glasses inside of it. Um, and so she's talking about the history of alcohol, which is a verily, socially like it's very socioeconomic um in that you know rich people drink wine and poor people drink meat and and that kind of stuff i do see a question in the chat new info on slavery section um hold on to your horses because that's what i've been working on <laughs> uh, so in the last year i had already begun the process of of creating an entirely new interpretive plan for tower grove house with regard to um, the people who worked for Henry Shaw, um, both in terms of immigrants or other laborers, and then those enslaved by Henry Shaw. So I have been in that process for some time, and now um, it's more relevant than ever to, to get going on that. So that's far beyond an artifact profile at this point, <laughs> um, but has been, um, it has been great to research, um, and I'm looking forward to sharing it all with you when the time the time is right. Hopefully that interpretive plan will impact both um, what is shared inside Tara Grove House, but also signage on garden grounds, programming that we do across divisions um, and, and beyond uh, to our virtual offerings, et cetera. So, so there's more to come uh, in that regard as well. You will see that there is a gap um, missing in that virtual TGH. Um, that information is not yet acknowledged in there um, because I'm, I'm working through the best way uh, to do that um, with our organization and their needs right now. So, so that might also be added to virtual TGH um, when the time is right.